Steve Posner of my staff is going to be helping me, and I, I've got uh, some slides I wanted to run through, and you have them in your hands there. What I'd like to do is just run through them quickly, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions, if that works. First of all, I want to thank Senator Udall for inviting me. More than that, I want to thank him for the contribution he's made in the Senate to fiscal responsibility. We would not have had a Bull simpson Commission had it not been for a handful of senators, including Senator Udall, who told the leadership that we will not back an increase in the debt limit unless there is a process to deal with getting the debt under control. And is that hammer that created the opportunity to have the Fiscal Commission, the so-called Bull simpson Commission. And it was a handful of senators who took that stand. Senator Udall was one of them. And I was so delighted when he got here because he has matched words with deeds and has insisted that we take this on. So uh, this is a tough environment, a very tough environment, because, frankly, on the left extreme and the right extreme, uh, their willingness to participate in compromise is very low. <laughs> and I think you'll be able to see when we're done here, what's required is that both sides move off their fixed position. And maybe not just both sides, because there's more than two sides here. I mean, there are lots of different views that people have about what can be done, what should be done. Let me just start out by kind of setting the stage. Back in 2008 and 2009, when we entered what was arguably the biggest downturn in the economy since the Great Depression, certainly in economic terms, this is the, the biggest drop-off we've seen in economic activity since the Great Depression. In the fourth quarter of 2008 alone, the economy was shrinking at a rate of almost 9%. In the first month of 2009, the economy lost 800,000 jobs. The housing market was in crisis. Everywhere you looked, there was a crisis. In fact, I will never forget being called here in September of 2008 uh, to an emergency meeting, leaders of the House and the Senate, Democrat and Republican, with the Secretary of the Treasury and the Bush administration and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve who told us if they didn't take immediate action, they believed there would be a financial collapse in this country in 10 days. I'll tell you, that gets your attention. So uh, I think it's very important what we remember uh, this history of where we've come. Let's go to that next slide if we can, Steve. This shows the economic performance from that fourth quarter of 2008 when the economy was shrinking at a rate of 9% or almost 9% and what's happened since. Uh, there are those who say TARP and stimulus didn't work. Um, I, I think the record r really quite clearly shows they did work. Uh, in fact, I believe the record will show we averted a depression and we went from very steep losses in terms of the economy shrinking to the economy recovering not as strongly as we would like certainly uh, but nonetheless quite a remarkable turnaround from an economy shrinking at a rate of nine percent to now averaging about two and a half percent growth um, although the most recent months are troubling uh, largely because of what we see happening in Europe. You know, Europe is really having a blowback effect on us. Let's go to the next slide if we can. Same is true on the jobs front. Uh, again, first month of 2009, we lost 800,000 jobs. Um, the corner got turned in about January of 2010. We moved back into positive ter 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 uh, territory. Since then, we've created more than 4.5 million jobs in this economy. Uh, so that's quite a remarkable turnaround. Again, not as strong as we would like, and the most recent jobs report was certainly concerning. And again, I think we uh, can attribute a lot of the re recent weakness to what we see happening in Europe, which has very significant uh, ramifications for us. 
So when we look to positive signs for the U.S. economy, we've had 27 consecutive months of private sector job growth, 11 consecutive quarters of real GDP growth. Unemployment rate is down substantially from the peak. Manufacturing has expanded for 34 consecutive months. Auto manufacturers have returned to profitability. Uh, they were on the brink of collapse. State revenues are showing signs of improvement. Um, and let's go to the next slide if we can. If we compare how we've been doing to our major competitors, we've been really doing the best. Um, you see us on terms of economic growth, we've outpaced our global competition. The United States is the blue line on top. The Eurozone is next in the green line. The red line is Japan. And uh, the purple line is the United Kingdom. Uh, they've really, they're doing the least well. And you'll remember what they have done is to impose austerity right away. Uh, not to do it in a phased way, but to start by taking tough medicine right away. And that strategy, it appears, has put them back into recession, which of course makes deficits and debt even worse. So what we're, what we're facing here is really a very tough problem because on the one hand, we've got to get this back on track for the longer term, which means we've got to uh, cut spending, we've got to reform entitlements, we've got to reform the revenue system, but we can't do it so abruptly that we put this thing back into recession. And I think that's the strong lesson we see around the world. Let's go to the next. In fact, the, the next slide is from the International Herald Tribune. Um, austerity is strangling Europe. Now, let's be clear. Europe's in a very different position than we are because they don't have a reserve currency. You know, the dollar is the reserve currency. So we're in a different situation than they are. We can actually be a little more patient with getting back on track, but not much more patient because we're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar. Uh, it can't continue that much longer. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, I, I get asked a lot, so what's holding us back? We, our recovery in uh, 2011 was perking along pretty well, and now we've seen some drop-off in that. Uh, here's what we see happening in 2011. First of all, the European debt financial crisis has thrown a cloud over global markets. And if you talk to business people, uh, they're seeing their orders drop off. And of course, Europe is our biggest trading partner. On top of that, the uncertainty over the Middle East. Will Israel attack Iran? Because if that happens, the Straits of Hormuz would get closed down. We'd see a big spike in oil prices. That would have a very adverse effect on economic activity, economic growth, job creation. And so businesses that are sitting on, by the way, $2 trillion on their balance sheets are reluctant to deploy those funds. They're reluctant to invest because they see what's happening in Europe and they see the possibility of a disruption in the oil supply in the Middle East. We also have federal, state, and local government cutbacks in spending creating fiscal drag. International Herald Tribune just did a very interesting analysis of what's happened to the size of government during this administration. And when you put together federal government, state and local, the size of government has actually shrunk. You know, we think, boy, with stimulus, the size of government has gotten bigger. That's true uh, for the federal level, but when you add in what's happened at the state and local level, Overall government has shrunk. In fact, we've had the biggest reduction in the size of government in many decades. And that's created some fiscal drag because that's money that's not moving in the economy, money that is not uh, strengthening demand. And right, what we have right now is weak demand. If you ask business leaders, why aren't you deploying that two trillion that's on your balance sheets? We don't have orders for our products. Now, that is weak demand. We have almost record low. In fact, at this moment, we have record low interest rates. Um, so that's not our problem. 
Our problem lies with weak demand. But that doesn't mean that we can be complacent about these deficits and debt because we've reached the danger zone. Our debt now is 100 percent of our GDP, our gross debt. And virtually every economic review has said when you get a debt of more than 90 percent of your GDP, that's the danger zone. We've also had political deadlock here on fiscal issues that creates uncertainty in the business world. What, what kind of taxes are we going to be paying? What's going to be the policy on energy? What's going to be uh, the policy with respect to the sequester that would cut an additional $1.2 trillion starting early next year? Um, and the slow decline in unemployment has undermined confidence. And, of course, the housing market is still shaky, at least in some markets, certainly in Las Vegas and Phoenix. Um, we see it most markedly. But there are other markets, too, that have certainly not recovered, and we still see weakness in the housing market. We talk about the fiscal cliff. Maybe, Steve, we can put that up. You, you, you've heard the terminology in the press, and the popular press, we're heading for a fiscal cliff uh, at the end of this year. Here's what they're talking about. At the end of this year, we're going to face an additional $1.2 trillion of spending cuts, about equally divided between defense and non-defense. That's on top of the $900 billion of spending cuts that was in the Budget Control Act of last year. We'll talk a little about, more about that in a minute. All of the tax cuts from 2001 and 2003 will be expiring at the end of this year. And uh, most economists would say that combination of more spending cuts and the elimination of all the tax cuts would further reduce economic growth. And in fact, the Congressional Budget Office, um, responding to a letter from me asking me for their analysis, asking them for, the, for the, their analysis, said that indeed if all the tax cuts expire at the end of this year and these additional spending cuts go into effect at the first of next year, we'll go back into recession. And, of course, that would make <laughs> deficits of debt even worse. The alternative minimum tax is going to be reimposed if we don't take action at the end of this year. The so-called tax expenditures, all the tax expenditures that are used to, for example, support research and development, uh, those are either expired or about to expire. The doc fix is got to be acted on, or the doctors who treat Medicare patients are going to face a more than 23 percent cut in their reimbursement. Uh, unemployment insurance extension is expiring, and a debt limit extension will be required not quite at the end of this year, but early next year. So you've got almost a perfect storm coming at us with respect to things that could have an adverse effect on deficits and debt, that could have an adverse effect on the economy. You hear a lot of talk from some of our colleagues that the Senate hasn't passed a budget in over a thousand days. Um, what they're talking about is a budget resolution. And instead of a budget resolution last year, we passed an actual law called the Budget Control Act. The Budget Control Act uh, said we're going to put in place the spending limits for this year and next year. And by the way, we're going to cap spending for the next 10 years, saving $900 billion. In addition, the Budget Control Act said we are going to give a special committee the authority to come up with a reform agenda for taxes and for the entitlement programs. And by the way, if you don't reach an agreement, there will be an additional $1.2 trillion of spending cuts. That's the so-called sequester. And because the special committee didn't agree, that additional $1.2 trillion of spending cuts is in law on top of the $900 billion. So last year, the Budget Control Act, an actual law, put in place $2 trillion of spending cuts. That's the biggest spending cut package in the history of the country. So when people say, well, there was no budget resolution passed, that's true. Instead, we passed a law. What's the difference between a resolution and a law? Anybody know? No, Mark, you can't answer. <laughs> a resolution is purely a congressional document. Budget resolutions never go to the president for his signature. 
The Budget Control Act is a law passed by the House and the Senate signed by the President. So the Budget Control Act has the force and effect of law. Re budget resolution doesn't have that same effect. And you can, in the language of it, I, I, I must say, I, I hear my colleagues saying, well, there's been nothing passed for a thousand days. Boy, it makes you wonder, do, uh, are they reading what they're voting on? <laughs> uh, sometimes I wonder. Because here's what it says. The allocations, aggregates, and spending levels set in subsection B1 shall apply in the Senate in the same manner as for a concurrent resolution on the budget for fiscal year 2012. That's the first clause. The second clause, that exact same language for, for the year 2013. So it is to act, this law is to act in the same way as a budget resolution. Let's go to the next slide if we can. Congressional Budget Office just gave us a new long-term outlook, and what they told us is very close to what they've been saying before. That is, we are headed for a fiscal cliff in more than one way. We're headed for a fiscal cliff at the end of this year because of the expiring of all the tax provisions and because of the sequester. But longer term, we have a debt that is out of control and it's got to be taken on, or it threatens our long-term economic security. Uh, this, what a chart sh shows us, is that by 2037, our debt would be 200% of our gross domestic product, or 200% of the size of our economy. Now, so what? That's just numbers on a page. Japan's debt is more than 200% of their GDP. They seem to be plugging along just fine. They're selling their Lexuses and their Hondas and, you know. Ah, but what we know uh, from a study that was just done by Rogoff and Reinhardt, looking at 200 years of economic history, 44 countries, is once your gross debt gets to more than 90% of, of your GDP, your future economic growth is reduced, and reduced quite markedly. Uh, in the range of 25 percent. So, you know, this really matters. It really matters to our economic future. Let's go to the next slide. When we look at the contributing factors, <clears throat> I always like to go to the numbers. You know, the rhetoric around here on both sides um, often misleads more than it, <laughs> more than it reveals. Um, the red line shows since 1950 the spending of the United States as a share of GDP. The green line shows the revenue of the United States since 1950. And it's really quite striking because what it shows us is on spending we're at or near a 60-year high. We've actually pulled off or a little lower than we were at the peak. Revenue, we're at, an, at or near a 60-year low. When some of our colleagues say we just have a spending problem, I, I would say they've got it half right. We do have a spending problem. We also have a revenue problem. And uh, my own conclusion is we're going to have to deal with both sides of this equation. And by the way, that's what the American people have concluded. When you ask them what we should do to reduce the deficit, 17 percent say just cut spending. Eight percent say just increase taxes. 62 percent say do a combination of both. And it's really, uh, I think that's the conclusion of virtually every bipartisan group that has come up with a solution, whether it's Bowles Simpson, which I was proud to be part of, or Rivlin Domenici, or any of the other bipartisan attempts, the Esquire panel, um, all of them have come up with plans that have both additional revenue and reform of entitlements because that's the fastest growing part of spending. It's not d uh, domestic discretionary spending that's the fastest growing. It is the entitlement programs, Medicare, primarily the health care accounts uh, that are the fastest growing. So here we are. We've got to decide what we're going to do. Uh, you want to put up that final slide, that's really what the Fiscal Commission concluded. 
in their moment of truth, uh, they recommended about $4 trillion of deficit and debt reduction uh, from what the debt would otherwise be over the next decade. I actually tried to convince them to go further. I tried to convince the Fiscal Commission to do $5.6 trillion of deficit and debt reduction over 10 years. Uh, why did I choose that number? Because we could actually balance the budget over 10 years if we would do $5.6 trillion. And, and I'll just say this on a final note. This isn't that hard. You know, it sounds like such big numbers. How can you possibly do this? Well, let me put it in perspective. If we would increase revenue from what is currently scheduled by 6 percent, if we would reduce spending from what is currently scheduled by 6 percent, we would close the gap by $6 trillion over 10 years and balance the budget. I call it the 6 percent solution. Remember, you had a guy running for president on 999? <laughs> he should have gone 666. <laughs> I'm not running for president. I'm not running for any office. I'm running for the border. But I, was, I say this to you. We can do this. We can absolutely do this, and we need to do it, and we can do it. In the Fiscal Commission, there were 18 of us. Eleven of us agreed to the plan. Five Democrats, five Republicans, and one Independent. So, you know, we can do this. And I've got confidence we will. And with people like Senator Udall, uh, still being here after I've departed, stage left, we'll get this job done. Thank you.